It's fine. Uh, I'd like to thank Avamed DX for having me here today. This briefing is a little bit of um, the perfect storm of my personal and professional lives colliding in that my best friend is here, and she's the director of reimbursement, I believe. That's her title <laughs> for Whole Logic. Um, and of course, I've met Carl several times through um, through knowing her there at the company. Um, I lead Deloitte's life sciences marketing efforts, and so I'm sitting on the panel with clients and targets, depending upon the year. <laughs> um, and, and, and Deloitte is an associate member of Avamed as well. So lots of familiar faces, including former CMS colleagues. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, in some ways, my uh, remarks are uh, will echo um, the good news around diagnostics and screening that we've heard here today. Uh, and in some ways, they will serve as stark contrast to what we've heard thus far. Um, <clears throat> I, um, you know, my, my mother is a 29-year survivor of cervical cancer diagnosed when she was 27. So it's great. We've had screenings for cervical cancer for you know years, and they're able to achieve wonderful outcomes, and that's great news. I myself had my own scare with cervical cancer about 18 months before my real nightmare began. began. But before I tell my personal story, um, I would like to just give a little context around um, gynecologic cancers. Um, every seven minutes, a woman will be diagnosed with a GYN cancer or below the belt cancer or re reproductive cancer in this country. Uh, these cancers are, include five, um, ovarian, which is the most deadly, uh, uterine, cervical, which we've heard a lot about today, as well as the lesser known but equally horrible vulvar and vaginal cancers. Um, there will be about 88,000 women diagnosed with one of the five cancers this year, and well over a third of these women will lose their battles to the cancers. Because as far as I know, there's only one uh, cancer that has a routine screening, and that is cervical. And furthermore, there are n no real minimally invasive diagnostics for these cancers either. <clears throat> So the challenge is that you can't be routinely screened and you, even despite the fact that it's 2012, is have to be subjected to incredibly invasive procedures to actually determine whether you have one of these cancers or not. So now I'll start my story, which um, begins in March of 2008 when I started having um, breakthrough bleeding during my um, cycle and I will apologize in advance to the men in the crowd. Uh, it, the OBGYN visit continues with my story. So <laughs> um, I had, I was, I was 30, I was 31 at the time and I'd always had a completely regular cycle. I'd been on the birth control pill for over 10 years starting when I was 20. I had changed birth control when I was 30 and about 18 months later I started having this irregular bleeding. Uh, as most women do when they start having something wrong with their bodies. I discussed it with a friend of mine who happens to be a physician assistant. And she said, you know, I think you've screwed up your birth control and I think you should just get off of everything for the summer and let your hormones reset. So I did what she suggested, but unfortunately the bleeding just became more erratic and heavy throughout the summer months. So when I had my routine physical exam in September, which I did every year. I had an annual exam every year. I discussed this bleeding with my doctor and he suggested that given my age and the fact that I didn't have breast or ovarian uh, cancer history in my family, I did have a strong cancer line including my mother's cervical but no breast or ovarian. He suggested that I probably just needed to get back on the hormonal birth control, uh, birth control pills to rebalance my hormones and the bleeding would subside. So I did that, and unfortunately, the bleeding just got wackier and heavier for the next three months, to the point which, uh, when I got back from a ski trip to Jackson Hole over the New Year's, I said, enough's enough. I got to get some answers to this. And I went back to my doctor at the end of January in 2009, and he said, okay, fine. I guess it's time for more testing. So we did what is available today, um, and that's kind of a puzzle together. There's no, again, no diagnostic and no screening. So you put a bunch of things together and you start getting some directionally accurate information. So I had a um, hormonal blood test and um, a, an ultrasound. And 
the blood test didn't re reveal anything abnormal, but the ultrasound revealed that I had <clears throat> a polyp in my uterus, which was probably causing the bleeding, bleeding, as well as what are known as chocolate cysts or endometrial cysts all over my ovaries. So <clears throat> that led us to do a DNC procedure to basically get re remove the polyp and um, to correct the bleeding. Unfortunately, um, that's when the real nightmare began because unlike 99% of uterine polyps, mine came back as cancerous. So my turn to be told I had a GYN cancer came at about noon on March 10th, 2009 at the age of 32. And it's interesting, Lisa discussed that she sort of had a gut feeling from the beginning of her process. And really hindsight being 2020, I did too. I, I, I knew that there had to be something more nefarious <laughs> lurking within me to cause this kind of clotting and bleeding. And I knew the moment that my doctor told me, my OBGYN told me that my polyp was cancerous, that I was not going to die from this cancer, but that it would change the rest of the course of my life. So in that moment, I, I sort of knew that I had months of treatment ahead of me, I would likely not have biological children, and that I would probably face awful things like surgical menopause at a very young age um, as a result of my cancer. So unfortunately, because of where we're at with the GYN cancers, that day he told me I had cancer, but he could supply me with no other information other than the name of the referral to a gynecologic oncologist. <clears throat> because based on what's available today, they can't tell you whether you had ovarian or uterine or any particular metastasis of either when they first diagnose you. Even in the year 2009, it took having an open laparotomy surgery uh, about a month later to determine that I had stage 3A ovarian cancer and stage 1 uterine cancer. Um, the uterine cancer, which is actually good news for me, was not a metastasis of the ovarian. It's a long story, which I won't get into, but they were separate cancers, the uterine sort of tangentially caused by the ovarian. So, um, you know, that, that meant the discovery of the advanced disease meant that I needed to enter into chemotherapy treatment. Um, so I had three rounds of IV chemo in the spring of 2009, during which... I lost 20, 25 pounds and went bald. I did keep my eyelashes and my eyebrows, which I will say <laughs> was hugely pleasing to me <laughs> because you could fake people out with a good wig as long as you have your eyebrows <laughs> and your eyelashes. And my mother's never been happier because I actually wore mascara and drew in eyebrows and yeah. So anyway, um, I, I hadn't had a full hysterectomy at the time of my diagnosis because of my because of wanting to preserve fertility. So after three rounds of IV chemo, where I was able to shrink my tumors significantly um, and bring down my CA twenty one twenty five, um, which is not a diagnostic but a good indicator once you've been diagnosed with cancer of cancer activity in your body. Um, I had my total hysterectomy in July of 2009, and then because I had been, quote unquote, minimally, uh, optimally debulked and that there was no visible tumor within me, <clears throat> and because of my young age, my gynecologic oncologist, um, Dr. John Elkis, uh, recommended that I have intraperitoneal chemo, which was a total surprise to me. I hadn't heard anything about this IP chemo. Come to find out, it's a, a great thing that gives much better outcomes, but it's pretty intense because at that point I had to have a chest and abdominal port put in my body and have drugs directly administered into my abdomen so as to coat the entire abdomen to pick up any spare cancer cells. Um, the last hour of each treatment, uh, the patient rotates around, not unlike a rotisserie chicken, so as to coat <laughs> the entire abdomen. Um, so that was um, loads of fun. And I finished my three rounds of IP in September of 2009. And I have been in full remission ever since then, three and a half years, uh, during which I've dedicated much of my free time and a lot of my professional time too, um, to the fight against these sets of cancers. Uh, the reason being, um, 
everyone believes a different thing, but I don't think things really happen for an, by accident. And um, I think the odds of an otherwise healthy 32-year-old woman who happened to grow up inside the Beltway and work in healthcare policy and communications getting one of these kinds of particularly deadly cancers that doesn't have a routine screening nor a minimally invasive diagnostic nor a particularly great treatment path um, today is the odds are one in, I don't know, a billion, billion. So I have taken it on as my personal mission to try to raise awareness and critical research funds of these cancers. Uh, I saw many women of all races, socioeconomic backgrounds, and frankly ages from very young to quite old uh, battling these diseases and dying around me during my six months of treatment. And they deserve better than what they're currently getting. Back to my comments um, on context, you know, 88,000 women are diagnosed this year with one of the five GYN cancers. That's a roughly the same number uh, of men who are diagnosed with prostate. However, we receive a fraction, and I apologize, I don't know the numbers, a fraction of the research funding that goes into prostate cancer. And that's simply, you know, unacceptable. And there are great examples that we've heard today of what can be achieved with research dollars. Um, in the development of screenings and diagnostics. I mean, the breast cancer is just a phenomenal story of advocacy and research and the outcomes. And um, I'm determined someday to see us get there. It, you know, a screening would be a great place to start. A minimally invasive diagnostic would be even more awesome. And, um, or I guess vice versa. And, and, then, and then if we could ever get to the stage of personalized medicine, where that would be like, a total, um, you know, home run in this. So, um, so that's my story, and and again, I think it just highlights the need for increased research and funding because it's not just really a women's health issue; it's really an economics issue. Cancer costs this country hundreds of billions of dollars every year, and it costs American businesses millions or if not billions of dollars. I myself was out of work on short-term disability for over six months dealing with my treatment. So, you know, there's, there's more than one reason to be invested in finding these kinds of diagnostics. Thank you.